thank you very much. Good morning to all the friends I'm seeing there. I just prepared a note, so I'm gonna kind of make a mix on some notes and and what I have in mind. Well, when I when I was invited by the organization to give this speech, I didn't have any idea what what, what should I say. But because a sizable share of my companions here in previous year are from Germany, I thought that it would be good for getting some cheap sympathy, sympathy to mention the UEFA Germans League that it's just taking place right now. But that may not have pleased our host, and even less our chairman, Andrea Muscolel. Surely he deserves that for making us going through his microeconomic books an average of 2.5 times per capita on this audience, as far as I know. But this is no time for our feelings. We're gathered here today to commemorate our experience at Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, meet old friends, and reflect together on the challenges that lay ahead. In the end, so I thought I would refer to three things. One thing is my experience at BGSE, then it's what have I done after BGSE, and then what I have found missing in the teachings of BGSE. I don't do this because I think my experience is unique or particular, but on the contrary, I think that my experience may reflect the, those of my companions and colleagues, and I really hope you feel identified on this. So on my experience at ESE, you come to ESE, that's the way I came, because I wanted to change my life. And I wanted to change my life by having the chance to change the life of others. And then, uh, when I came here, I have lived a bit, I have worked for 10 years, and I wanted to change the course of my life. And it's very funny, because when you arrive here to change your life and the life of others, the, the first thing that you find out is you have no life. So your life is just surrendered to the deposit of the IWES for a certain amount of time, and you have, your life is completely gone. And those first days are very, very confusing. They were very confusing to me, because then you start talking to your companions and you say, no, no, this is just too long. I don't think this is what they want from us. We may have taken the wrong way because, I mean, doing this problem set, it will be like days or even weeks. So I don't think this is the way it goes. So well, after, after submitting 10 problem sets of microeconomics in 10 weeks in a row, then I don't think any of us can be asked anything at our workplace that we say, I don't think I can make this. So anything is possible after a GSE. And for my last point on my experience at ESE, I would like to, to use a, a famous quote of Woody Allen on his stand-up comedy show in, in New York. He used to begin his show by saying a joke on two French women. I don't know what they're friend, French. Uh, two French women having a dinner at a restaurant. And in the end of the dinner, one woman says to the other, did you notice that in this restaurant the food tasted like crap? It was like shit. And the other says, like, Yes, that wasn't the worst. The worst is that, did you see how small the portions were? <laughs> so Woody Allen, in his show, used this as a proxy for life. I mean, you, we are always complaining. We are always complaining about our life, and then if, when it's about to end, then we want one more day, one more month of that life. And I don't know for you, but for me, uh, Barcelona Graduate School of Economics worked exactly in that way. I spent here two years, I did two masters, I did every one of them waiting till the very end day, last day. And then we all realized that it just goes all too fast. And then we just want one more quarter. If I could take one more course of this, of all this crap, it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the way I feel towards GBGSE. Well, my life did change after GBGSE. In July 2012, I was invited to coordinate the macroeconomic policy team of Venezuelan presidential candidate Enrique Capriles Radonsky. We lost that election by a 10% margin, and we just lost it again by a minus 0.2% margin. <laughs> <laughs> So working on this team was a lot of fun. I mean, this is no boring stuff such like the German economy or even the Chilean economy. Venezuela is plagued with exchange control. We have interest rate control. We have three-tiered exchange rate system. We have interest rate that the passive rate is 20% below inflation. We have capital controls. We have that fighting workers below a certain salary level. It's completely forbidden. We have 40% of a nominal GDP owned by the government and years along, etc. So this is a lot of fun. So within this context, most of what you learn here becomes completely useless. <laughs> I mean, as long as you look for some specific lesson, if you don't look for that, but you look for the big picture, 
It's not that. It's just the common sense, the rigorous structure of thinking, and the capacity to work hard that we develop here that becomes the most useful asset in such a situation. Within this experience, I found two puzzles that I want to share with you, because I was told that I should bring up issues for further research here. So. <laughs> and one thing is that um, there is no literature and no recipe on the sequence and time of, of economic reform when it comes to transitioning from a heavily government intervening economy to a free market economy. So there's no way. I mean, we, we went to Harvard, we had a round table with Guillermo Calvo and Ricardo Hausmann and a lot of guys that helped us, and they really had no idea on how to do this. So it, is, it was very surprising. And this is probably a consequence of the way the Berlin Wall came down and the dismantling of the socialist regimes because they obtain a meager share of the votes in the subsequent elections. So in, in every country that transitioned from socialism to a market economy, the governing party got like 50, 20 percent of the votes. So you have a party coming with a huge majority that has a huge room of maneuver to make all the reforms. And because of that, they didn't spend time thinking of whether there was an appropriate timing to do this, an appropriate sequence that will have a higher impact on welfare. So I find this a great opportunity, and this becomes particularly important for us, and particularly important when you have the National Assembly against, and you may win, in the best of cases, for a 0.5% difference. So Latin America, at least, is plagued with history and stories of failed economic reform due to inappropriate timing and sequence. This means that we try to fix everything at once at the same time, and it just doesn't work, or at least it's not sustainable. As it turns out, we know very little on the appropriate timing and sequencing of economic reform. And the second thing, it's something that is happening in Venezuela that serves as an example for the rest of the world because it's happening elsewhere, but not in that magnitude. Our fiscal deficit, which is 18% of GDP, it's financed through printing money, just bare, plain printing money. So uh, liquidity is growing at a 70% rate a year, and our GDP is mostly stagnant. But inflation is running at 20, 25 percent. So it's been a lot of years by printing money, it doesn't show up in inflation. And this is not about that inflation rate, it's not like the Argentinian one. We haven't got it there yet. So there are guys at MIT, Roberto Rigobon among them, measuring inflation for 12 years, and they say that this is surprising. And this is also happening in the US. We see all this printing money that doesn't show up in inflation, and then we have no explanation for this. And it will be good to have an explanation because other guys refuse to print money and are having a lot of trouble. So it will be good to know what will be the consequence of printing money. The, but the, the fact is that large, uh, large lags between the growing the money supply and the sum of GDP and inflation are now common all over the world, at least to the extent that you can print your own currency. And they have rendered the good old quantitative theory of money completely useless. So this I find interesting. And then at last, I want to talk about what I've missed now that I'm out, what I, what I missed while I was here. I feel I came to study in Europe at a unique point in time, at a time when a large experiment, the Euro, was taking place. And I found very little debate on that, on, on GSE and, or UPF at large. Professors surely talk about that among themselves, but refuse to venture into those conversations with students, either in external forums, extracurricular activities, or even in the cafeteria. Our academia seems to be sailing the same words of mathematics at a time when, to use the words of Jack's dress at the latest BGSE lecture, there's nothing more important, no place where research can be more fruitful than in studying and proposing ways out of the current European crisis. The climax of this came at a Nobel round table organized uh, somewhere in the middle of last year by IDEA because it was the 25th uh, year anniversary. And they had uh, Robert Lucas there, Nobel laureate. And when Lucas was asked what will be his recipe for the Europe going out of the crisis, he said a very thoughtful and sensitive thing. Anyone should fire anyone at any time with no cost and without having to give anyone any explanation. So that was Lucas' recipe. So I'm convinced that some more debate around the world's contemporary economic problems, in particular the European crisis, will really help as a motivator to GSE students to get into top-notch research. Um, I mean, economics cannot be, when I got into policy, uh, doing policy in Venezuela, 
then you got like, I talked to Jaume Ventura and Jaume said, and now you want to do politics, right? No, no, I don't want to do politics, I want to do policy. But economic policy is about rule of thumbs. People make calculations back of the envelope and things like that. And then economic research is about these crazy math models. And then these guys are sailing all this through completely different highways and they never get along. So I think we as students, we really have a challenge, whatever we are, to bring closer those ends. I mean, the ends of practical economic policy and the end of, I mean, that doesn't prevent high top-notch research from supporting that policy. And that was my last remark. I just wanna say a last word, and this is gonna be hard, so I'm gonna read. Uh, last thought to my dear friend, Michael and Reiter, who as you know, decided to abandon us a week ago. He was an outstanding PhD student, and Michael was a rare combination of superb intelligence, hard work, and comradeship. He was chosen, I was here last year, when he was chosen best teaching assistant amongst all UPF, and that was mainly because his TA at Microeconometrics, which I attended and barely passed, and it was thanks to Michael. I had the privilege to study with Michael, and then I had the privilege of being his student, and more important, I had the privilege of being his friend. So Michael, we all wish you a safe trip. We will keep you in our prayers and we will reserve a very special pray within our hearts to store all those memories of our times together. Thank you very much. start now. <laughs> um, so many things on my mind actually from the er early lectures as well. So I mean it's kind of tempting to put up the response from the north now to <laughs> well, I got to try to do that. I think the only thing which really is kind of troubling is that I mean in all the speeches it's always about Germany and I mean as an example or as a problem but you hear little about uh, Italy and, and France, and I think that's probably a good symptom of the crisis, what we have in Europe right now, that there really is just no one else to look at, at the, apparently. So, yeah, that's very really sad as well. No, but the thing I want to talk about actually is something else. So it goes in a similar direction as Miguel before me. Uh, I want to talk about how to sort of make use of this alumni network exactly for those questions because, I mean, after all, what can you do? Why, why, why have such a network here? Huh? And there are like, I think, three, at least three functions, all sort of matching. So matching people like today, which is great, having an excuse to come to Barcelona and meet old and new friends. Uh, secondly, matching jobs, so sort of vertical matching. So you wanna match pe uh, senior people and younger people and, and recruit them possibly. This is probably gonna take place more in the future when we all are a bit more senior and not just all very junior or researchers. And the third thing is the matching of ideas, resources and skills, I think. And this is actually what I wanna talk about. So from a personal point of view, as I left GSE last year, I mean, one of the reasons to leave and not for go for a PhD was kind of a lack of ideas, you know, of, of questions, of research questions that felt like they were worth spending considerable amount of time on them and having the feeling that they actually contribute something to society or solving the problems such as the debt crisis or, or the other crisis as we heard in Venezuela, for example. Now, after um, roughly a year in the central bank, um, this is somewhat changing now. So you see every day the problems described by Mr. Masculel and you see the problems really, I mean, the, the difficulties and also really the boundaries of knowledge we have. I mean, we know very, very little and we understand very, very little and we have sometimes absolutely no idea what to do. I mean, if you look, for example, in my case, look at macroprudential supervision. So it's the fancy new thing around the world. Everybody wants to do it, everybody likes it, everybody thinks it sounds nice and it does. I mean, you talk about bubbles, asset prices, stability, um, networks. That's all very cool, right? But then you ask, so what can I do? I mean, what, what, how do you know that this network is stable? How do you see, how do you make a policy choice? I mean, how do you have a threshold or something? 
because you need something. I mean, you are right now in Germany, for example, it sounds crazy, probably to the rest of Europe, but there's a debate about property prices that we have a boom or a bubble maybe there. Now, the question is how do you, how do you make sure that this actually is a bubble under uncertainty? What's the kind of level of prices you would say, now we have to act? And nobody really knows, yeah? Nobody even really knows what prices to look at, what kind of number to look at. There are many ideas, obviously, but you can always argue for one thing or the other. So there's so much room for research there. That's just one piece. And also one piece I hadn't seen before at the school here. It's sometimes probably too much on the macro level, but anyway. And similarly, I mean, the tools, so what we have right now is, is capital buffers. So you put some buffers in the balance sheet and the banks. But this is not very creative is anyway. I mean, it's basically the same thing, the same old story we had in banking supervision also before the crisis. And there must be some more innovative or no more recent tools. I mean, something new to do, something really creative. And I haven't seen that so far. And I think these are kind of the questions I think that should be asked and that should be also discussed a little bit more intensely during the studies here because, I mean, it's good to know the theory and, and the tools and have the capacity to understand those topics, but you also need to sometimes reflect them on the actual reality. So now, long story short, so what can we do in the GSE? I mean, uh, last year probably I would have wished to have someone to talk to, you know, and, and just check and spare your ideas with and just say, well, look, I'm kind of interested in financial stability, whatever, and now I have these kind of ideas, but are they actually relevant? I mean, do you care about them? Or does anybody care about them? Or do you have a better idea? Or can I, can I go into some direction which would be maybe uh, more to your needs? And I think this should happen, actually, because, I mean, we have so much researchers here. We have, uh, I think, I looked in the alumni thing, and we have probably all the central banks in Europe, plus the ECB, and also the Federal Reserve System uh, is present as well as lots of research companies and consultancies. So making this exchange happen, I think, would be really a great thing, both for the research side as well as for the practical side. And so if anyone wants to push for that, I don't know how to do that. Maybe some IT platform, some web-based mail list, I don't know. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that or uh, to approach me. But I think it would be really great to have that exchange happen. Um, yeah, because, I mean, in the end, the GSE network is very young, it's very homogeneous, we are all economists, so this has advantages and disadvantages. I mean, if you look at the LSE alumni network, for example, of course, it's a different story, right? I mean, they, they do have some capacities we don't and we won't have in the near future, but on the other hand, we can really know each other because it's small enough, and I think we also know what kind of level we have here. And, so let's make the best of that, and otherwise, yeah, I'm basically done. No, no, no chocker in the end, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I will not try to find words for that. Uh, was, yeah, no, no, there's really no words. Thank you.